Yksi lukki on päällä. Ah, Tekniä on Yksi. Once again, I'm delighted and honored to introduce you our second, yet second to none, keynote speaker, Wojciech Malec. And as I already mentioned yesterday, Wojciech is a university professor at literary theory and a notorious metalhead in the University of Rocklaw, Poland. His research focuses on the impact of literature and media on society and on public attitudes toward the environment. His writings have been published in journals such as Poetics and Fire, as well as in other media, including New York Times and Psychological Today. From the perspective of empirical eco-criticism, perhaps his best known work is a book, Human Minds and Animal Stories. Our narrative makes us care about other species. Actually, I bought that book a couple of years ago and loaned it to Olli, who never returned it. So it must be quite useful. It's available in open access now. Yeah. <laughs> we have used it a lot. Professor Malecki is also one of the authors of a groundbreaking anthology. Empirical Ecocism, which will be released later this year, titled Measuring Environmental Effects, Experimental Methods and, uh, in Empirical Ecocriticism. Today, he will discuss the experimental methods, ecocriticism, and effects, drawing on examples taken from his earlier research on the impact of animal stories. And after his presentation, Associate Professor Elisa Aaltola from the University of Turku will give her comments. Please welcome. Oh, thank you, Tony, for this introduction. And I would like to begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me and for, and for putting this event together. So thank you, Tony. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Pano. Uh, thank you, Oli. Uh, and then thank you, Niklas, and, and uh, thank you, Ika, and thank you, uh, Ita, for, uh, for uh, putting all this together. This has been a wonderfully organized conference, and it gives me great pleasure to be here, and for all kinds of reasons. So first of all, because um, Tony and the crew, the team here, are pioneers of empirical criticism in, in Finland, and that's very important to me, and the work uh, they have been doing here on the impact of uh, young adult climate fiction on, on students is very important from both uh, a scholarly and a practical point of view. And I tried to explain that yesterday why I think so. And, and it's wonderful stuff. And, and another reason is that I've always had a lot of admiration for the work of Anskan scholars and Finnish environmental humanists in particular. Uh, Pano's work in eco-emotions has been very important to me. And so is, I'm happy to say, the work of my commentator today, Elisa Altola. I really uh, love her uh, 2012 book on, on animal suffering and her recent work on, on, uh, on empathy toward animals. This is great stuff. And I also admire Lisa for the fact that she works on this stuff, not only within the boundaries of academia, but also as a public intellectual and, and, and even engages in politics. And this is very rare. And, and this, is, this makes me all the more happy. Uh, that I'm here, and I also wanted to say that I've uh, my experience thus far at this conference confirms my admiration for Enscan. All the papers were brilliant and and inspiring, and I just hope uh, that mine will be just as inspiring. Um, and finally, last but not least, thank you all for attending this talk uh, in person and on online. I really appreciate that. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about I'm going to be talking about uh, measuring environmental effects. <laughs> Uh, experimental methods in uh, ecocriticism. And uh, uh, a lot of people during this conference have talked very competently about uh, what empirical ecocriticism is, uh, uh, yesterday in particular, but for those of you who uh, have not attended the, the, uh, the sessions yesterday, just a quick reminder. Uh, so, I think. 
So empirical criticism is an emerging subfield of ecocriticism that focuses on the empirically grounded study of environmental narrative and literature, film, television, et cetera, and its influence on various audiences. And the main objective of empirical ecocriticism is to put to empirical tasks claims made within ecocriticism and the environmental humanities more generally about the impact of environmental narratives. And to this end, it employs empirical methods used in disciplines such as environmental communication, environmental psychology, and the empirical study of literature. And Matthew yesterday talked about the use of uh, qualitative empirical methods, and these can be uh, ethnographic interviews or focus group studies, all kinds of things. And today I'm going to, be, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, quantitative methods, the experimental method in uh, particular. So I will discuss why experiments can be useful, useful for studying complex causal relations that are of the utmost importance to ecocriticism and environmental humanities uh, more generally, in particular those that concern affects, uh, that is emotions, attitudes, and other mental states that involve evaluative feeling. And I do realize there are different definitions of, of uh, the term affect, but this is the one that I uh, use here, and it's, and it's uh, borrowed from the field of affect uh, studies. So anything, any mental states that, that involves evaluated feeling is uh, understood here as an affect, and I'm going to be talking about those kind of mental uh, states. And as for the questions about causal relationships, uh, 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 related to affects that are of uh, interest to the environmental humanities. Here are some examples. Uh, scholars in, in that field, they ponder, they think about such questions all the time. They're very common. Can environmental narratives promote interspecies empathy? Could fictional narratives change our approach to pressing environmental issues such as climate change? And could the dominant emotional tone of pro-environmental messages, melodramatic, somber, and serious, be counterproductive? discouraging people from taking part in pro-environmental uh, initiatives. And this is the famous argument of, of the book, Bad Environmentalism. And finally, can narratives improve social attitudes to non-human animals? And the latter question is the question that I'm going to be focusing. In my presentation, I'm going to be, I'm going to draw from uh, some examples of the use of experimental method uh, in ecocriticism uh, from the research that my team and I um, have conducted on, on uh, the impact of animal narratives. Now, as to why we focused on uh, why, why this question, why this topic is important, uh, consider that countless scholars, activists, and writers, and including such greats as Leo Tolstoy and Thomas Hardy, have postulated that narratives can improve attitudes toward non-human animals. So this is a widely held claim, very uh, by all kinds of people. And consider also that countless organizations and media outlets have used animal stories to stoke support for pro-animal causes in the past, sometimes with great success. And this is one of the, uh, and here's one example, probably the most famous historically. This is a book, Black Beauty. Many of you uh, know oh, it by Anna Sewell. Uh, it was published in 18... 77, and this book, this novel, tells the story of, uh, of uh, uh, can we get the presentation back? It's... Okay, yeah, you're good. Uh, tells the story about the times and life of a certain horse named Black Beauty. And in particular, it describes various practices toward horses that were common at the time in England, but were, all, but were at the same time immensely cruel. And one of those was, for example, the so-called bearing rain. As you can see, this uh, was very painful to the horse, but at the same time, people at the time thought this makes the horses look graceful. They liked the, the, the aesthetic, uh, the, they thought as aesthetic, the, the shape of the, of the neck. And, and the book, the novel describes such practices from the perspective of the horse, which is the narrator of the novel. And that book, even though the, the uh, the writer was was an amateur, fifty something uh, debutante, uh, and her remark, her skills, literary skills were not that remarkable. That book immediately became a bestseller, eventually becoming one of the biggest selling books of all time, one hundred million copies sold. But this is not the most remarkable thing about that book. What is the most uh, remarkable thing about this book is that it uh, 
apparently moved by the suffering inflicted upon the equine protagonist by callous humans, readers of the novel became, uh, began uh, writing uh, letters of protest to newspapers, joining humane societies and, and urging their political representatives to delegalize the practices that were described in the novel. And you know what? They were successful. So as a result of the impact of the novel, uh, many of those practices were delegalized and some others became uh, far less popular because there was a, then the, uh, after the novel was published, after that impact, there was a, social, uh, a kind of social stigma attached to those uh, practices. And for a more recent example, I think you all know the film, it's Babe, uh, and uh, maybe you uh, have not heard about it, but uh, many scholars, talk about the, the supposed imp social impact of that, of that film. So there is the phenomenon of so-called babe vegetarians. They're even called that way. So there are people who watch babe. And this is the switch that I talked about uh, 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 in my comments to, to, to one of the papers in the morning. So that, uh, that uh, story succeeds at portraying a meat animal that is normally seen as an object as a subject, as, as something akin to a pet. And this changed people's, uh, many people's attitudes so much that they changed their diet. And some scholars also know that there was a stagnation in the pork market in the year, in the US, in the year of the movie's release, right? That might, that might have been a coincidence, but, but uh, this is what they do. So we have those, we have those kind of examples, right? About the, the, the impact of, of narratives. But the problem for, for that seemingly support that claim made uh, by those many scholars and artists that uh, narratives can change our attitudes toward animals. But there's a problem um, here in that we only have this kind of evidence. So the data this belief uh, relies on is uh, or was mostly of historical, speculative, and, and anecdotal nature. And this is not enough, even if you have such nice examples, because it is always possible that <laughs> lucky coincidences. So that there was a, a collusion of factors that is really very um, improbable. So you cannot count on narratives doing that work. Uh, that's, that will be counting on, on, on uh, very, very uh, unusual good, good luck. And in general, beliefs about social impact often turn out to be wrong when submitted to empirical scrutiny, even if they have been bolstered by that kind of evidence. So even if they seem intuitive, you know, even if we see anecdotal uh, evidence, and here are some, some examples. This is one of my favorite books about environmental attitudes, Navigating Environmental Attitudes by Thomas Herberlein. And this documents his lifetime work on environmental attitudes. And he talks in that book about environmental education. That is giving people information about our impact on the environment and counting that this will change their attitudes. Sounds intuitive, right? Everybody thinks this, this is the way things work. You have millions of dollars and euros pumped into such programs. But you know what? Herberlein shows that this doesn't work. It just does not work. Uh, this is totally counterintuitive, but uh, no actual effects. Uh, and here's another example from another book that I love. Some we love, some we hate, some we eat by Hol Herzog. Hol, Hol Herzog is one of the pioneers of human animal studies uh, or anthrozoology. Uh, and in this book, he talks uh, among many other things. This is a fascinating book uh, uh, about uh, the widely held claim that if somebody is cruel to animals when they're uh, a child, they will grow up to be cruel to human beings. So it's, it's so famous that one, uh, there's called even the link uh, in those circles. And one uh, pro-animal organization even copyrighted the term the link to, to refer to, to this thing. And you know what? Empirical data shows that this is not true. So if you compare people who are cruel to animals in their childhood and other people, at least uh, according to what Herzog says in the book, this there's just no uh, relationship. So what do you do? Uh, yeah. uh, just putting the shares to the back because okay. Okay. So we're not sharing the, the slides, yes? Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry, the people. Sorry, folks there. Sorry. Yeah, again, so so what do you do? Uh, so what do you do? Uh, so what do you do when you uh, so if anecdotal and historical data of this kind 
does not work, cannot support, uh, cannot support your uh, uh, hypothesis like that. So what do you do? And you need, you need, uh, you need empirical data. You need to test your hypothesis empirically. So to come back to our, a second, okay. So, so to come back to our hypothesis, reading animal stories causes people to have better attitudes toward animals. You need to test it empirically, but again, not any kind of empirical evidence will do. Uh, for example, imagine that we conducted a survey. So we uh, asked people if they read uh, animal narratives, how often they read animals, and we tested their attitudes toward animals. And it turned out that the, the survey shows that people who do read animal stories more often also tend to have better attitudes toward animals. Does that confirm our hypothesis? No, it does not, because it only shows a correlational relationship between reading animal stories and attitudes. And correlational relationship speaking statistically is the kind of relationship between two variables such that if the value of one of these variable changes, the other, the value of the other variable changes in a systematic way. So in this way, we're showing that more uh, you're reading animal narratives more often, your attitudes get uh, better or, or, or you have better or, or uh, more pro-animal attitudes. And uh, this kind of results is uh, consistent with many, uh, with, with a few uh, causal pathways. So some possible, possible causal pathways here is uh, one of these is something that uh, is consistent with our hypothesis that it is that the reading animal narratives uh, change people's attitudes. But what is also possible is that people who have better attitudes toward animals, they just are more interested in animal narratives. And this is why they read animal narratives more often. So the correlation, correlational data such, such as the, the hypothetical data that we talked about is consistent with this too. And another possibility is that there is a still another factor that influences both reading animal stories and attitudes toward animals. So there's no direct relationship between these two. But for example, people with a certain kind of personality tend both to have better attitudes toward animals and uh, uh, like to read animal stories. So empirical correlational data is not enough. What you need is, the solution is evidence from controlled randomized experiments. So this is, this is the kind of evidence that you need to have. These are the kind of studies that you need to conduct experiments. Now, what are these? This may sound very technical, but you know the procedure from uh, what you hear about the uh, clinical trials of drugs, right? So this is, so imagine you wanna test whether uh, vitamin C, the impact of vitamin C of people who are sick with the flu, right? So you have the population of people who are sick with the flu. Obviously you cannot test them all. That would be practically, there are too many of those people practically impossible. So you draw a sample of these people. And there are procedures that allow you to uh, calculate what kind of sample you need in order to have valid results. And then you randomly assign these people to an experimental group, uh, intervention group that is given vitamin C, and you have the control group that is given a placebo. And this allows you then when you compare how, uh, for example, how long they suffer from the flu, this allows you to uh, determine whether it was vitamin C that caused any changes, if there are any changes. And uh, I'm not gonna be talking about why there needs to be randomization uh, or why people in the control group needs to be, need, need to be given a placebo. I'm willing to talk about it during the Q&A. So, but I'm just describing the general procedure. And this is exactly, uh, the kind of designs that you use when you study uh, the impact of narratives of, on, on people's attitudes toward animals or any, anything else. So you have a sample of, of, of readers, you have an experimental group that is giving, for example, an animal narrative, you have a control group that is giving a narrative, what I call a narrative placebo, that is they read a narrative that is not related to the topic of, of animals, and then you compare uh, their, uh, then you compare their attitudes toward animals. And this is, ex this is what we did uh, together with my team as part of this project that was funded by a grant from the National Science Center Poland, Poland, the impact of narratives on attitudes toward animals and their welfare, an empirical study. And I was privileged to work on that project with, with uh, 
very bright colleagues, Bogusov Pavlovsky, who's a biological anthropologist and evolutionary psychologist, uh, Piotr Sorokovsky, who's a social psychologist, experimental social psychologist, and Marcin Chinsky, who's a literary uh, historian. And the outcome of that project uh, were 15 experiments involving almost 4,000 participants and uh, demographically diverse. So typically, so Matthew was talking about very often empirical study, experimental studies, especially in psychology, they involve uh, students. So this is a, these are samples that uh, it's very difficult to generalize from students to, to the overall population. And there are even jokes that if uh, psychological journals were to bear names, titles that reflect their samples, they would have to be called like the personality and psychology of American undergraduate psychology students or something like this. So we had a very diverse uh, uh, sample of people. And we also tested in our experiments texts representing various national literatures and genres, American literature, Canadian, Russian, Italian, Polish, and we worked with journalistic stories, fiction, and essays. And I'm also happy to say that we were able to have those uh, wonderful samples of readers, very diverse, uh, thanks to the cooperation of just this gentleman, Marek Krajewski. You uh, probably have not heard about him, but in Poland, you don't need to, but in Poland, he's a major literary star. He's a best-selling author of detective fiction, one of the biggest authors there. And he's also an, 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 an uh he, he also has pro-animal attitudes, and it was not that difficult to convince for us to convince him to join our project. So what he did, this, this uh, great guy, was, was he wrote an animal story according to our suggestions, and he implanted that in his novel, uh, What's Our Age? So it was there, and he helped us study the impact of, of that narrative on, on his readers. Um, and and Krajewski, as I said, he's a major literary star in Poland. Uh, his work has been translated into 15 languages. I don't think it was translated into Finnish, but uh, uh, many of his novels are available in, in, uh, in English, for example. It's like uh, very dark detective fiction. Uh, uh, so, so he did that. He implanted that, that in, in, in his book, helped us to study the impact of that narrative on his readers. And I'm happy to say that the results of our experiments overall, 15 experiments, is that narratives do improve people's attitudes toward animals. So that's the, we we're talking about the importance of being optimistic, a positive uh, outcome. So yes, they make people, literary narratives can make people more pro-animal and including that story that was implanted there. So I'm happy to say that one of the outcomes of our project was not only scholarly results, but an actual story that is out there. The book became a bestseller. So there are thousands of people there reading the book and their uh, attitudes are being improved right as we speak. Uh, it's still in print and so on. Uh, anyhow, so so, this, uh, uh, and we also were able to study the mechanisms behind that impact. In particular, uh, we were able to establish that the effects of such narratives on, on uh, people's attitudes toward animals uh, result from so-called ambassadorial narrative empathy. And I, and I borrowed that term from Suzanne Keen. Uh, and the mechanism is this. So we are first made to empathize or feel, feel with an, indivi an individual depicted in a story who suffers because of their belonging to a given group. So this can be the suffering of an animal who suffers because it is an animal. So you have a farm animal, it suffers because of what people do typically do to farm animals. Then we are made to sympathize or feel for that individual in the story. And that attitude eventually translates into increased moral concern for that group as a whole. So it's important that it's clear that the suffering is related to a given protagonist or character belonging to a certain group, and then it might translate to, to that group as a whole that it represents. And I'm using general terms here because this applies not only to animals. These were studies about narratives concerning know, drug addicts, HIV patients, this is, this is a universal mechanism. And we are able to show that experimentally that this is the mechanism that works for animal stories in our paper, 2019 paper, Feeling for Textual Animals, Narrative Empathy Across Species Line that was published in, in Poetics. And, and in general, uh, so this is, this is the, uh, let's say the structure of that, of that mechanism uh, uh, put schematically. And, and all of our experiments, if you're, if you're interested, are, are described in this book, which I'm happy to say is available open access, uh, Routledge, it, I mean, it was, it was very well received. 
So it immediately got published in paperback, and and now Ralvich, uh, and then later Ralvich says it, it's people want to read it. Let's 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 just get it to uh, let's publish it in open access. So so that's I'm happy to say it's available. But um, and and in the remainder of my paper, I'm going to talk about how experimental uh, studies not only allow us to confirm our intuitions, but also allow uh, give us results that are counterintuitive that are uh, surprising. And the first, the first uh, uh, such result that I'm, that I'm going to talk about is, uh, and this study is described in this book too, was a study about that compared the impact of uh, na animal narratives that are perceived uh, as fictional and those that are perceived as non-fictional. Because you have animal narratives like literary narratives, like Black Beauty perceived as fictional, but you also have journalistic narratives that deal with facts. And there is a, this long going controversy in theory, which narratives perceived as fictional or non-fictional are more effective, more persuasive. So th this is still not uh, resolved. Some people say non-fictional narratives are perceived as non-fictional because intuitively it makes more sense to change one's mind about real social issues on the basis of factual information rather than fabricated stories. Sounds intuitive, right? Yeah, sounds sounds. And there is some evidence from experimental data. There was this study by C. Daniel Batson that, but it concerned stories about humans. There were no, there was no data on stories about animals. Uh, so, so that's not uh, really conclusive. But then there are people who say, these are fictional narratives or narratives that are perceived as non-fictional that should be more persuasive. Why? And this goes back to an old argument that you can find in Aristotle. And, this is because fictional discourse provides us with a space in which we can give in to our feelings relatively safely without having to consider the practical consequences of doing so. So uh, as Keith Oatley, uh, a great uh, uh, empirical scholar of, of literature, psychologist, and, and also a writer puts it, here is social life without obligation, meeting without responsibility. Whereas in real life, one is always reminded that a bleeding heart can cost a bloody lot. Excuse the pun. I liked it when it came to my to, to my mind, so so I so I put it there. But but so the thing is, it, if you watch a journal, if you read a journalistic story and you give in to your sympathy, then you always have it in the back of our heads, and I have to do something with it. I should act, otherwise I'm I'm a jerk. But but then it, when it's fiction, you can just give in to that. And so when you read fiction, you can afford to yield to your emotions to a greater degree than when than when you read nonfiction. Okay, so we did a study that compare those two kinds of narratives. And before I give you the result, who is for nonfiction? Just raise your hands. Who thinks it should be nonfiction? Yeah. The rest is fiction? Yeah, okay. So more votes for fiction. Oh. Ta-da! <laughs> so so, the, so the, the answer is neither, actually. So while the story that we uh, 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 study uh, significantly improved the reader's attitudes as compared to the control group. There was no significant difference between the degree of that influence between the two groups. So we had the same story so that the experiment is clean, but in one condition, we made the participants believe that it's fictional and the other, we made them believe that it's non-fictional. And you can do that with uh, metatextual framing. So, uh, and when you get a counterintuitive results, because intuitively you think there should be some difference, right? This is they are so. This is these are such different uh, uh, mental structures involved, and then we begin to look for other studies on, on the topic uh, more closely. And it turned out that our results corroborate the results of studies which show that the impact of the of narratives does not always depend on the real world status. That is on whether they are perceived as fictional or not. And that status has turned out not to have any significance for the influence of stories on empathic understanding toward people undergoing severe grief or depression. That's a great uh, uh, study by, by a Dutch scholar. And perceived fictionality has been also reported to lack any impact on how stories affect the reader's beliefs. And this is a classic study uh, by Green and Brock on so-called narrative transportation, a very widely uh, uh, cited paper on some of the basic mechanisms of, of narrative persuasion. No, but, but, but uh, and, and as the authors, Green and Brock of one of these studies summarized their findings, it appears that, and I quote, once a reader is rolling along with a compelling narrative, the source which the narrative draws on has diminishing influence. In this fashion, the belief positions implied by the story might be adopted regardless of whether they correspond, corresponded with reality, right? But that sounds cool. 
But as a researcher, you always have to ask, but why, right? Why, why is that so? Excuse me. So our hypothesis is this. Uh, the answer has to do with the fact, so we looked at the kind of narratives that were used in those studies, in our study and those other studies. So the answer has to do with the fact that in the case of the studies referenced above and our experiment, the experimental stories concern matters that, are, that undoubtedly elicit strong emotions. So these were matters such as depression, grief. In the experiment, we used a story about the inhumane slaughter of horses. And one of these stories involved being brutally stopped by a psychiatric patient, all very intense emotions, right? And that's important. Because according to current neurology, matters of this kind are processed by a different part of the brain than the information about whether the story that touches on them is true. So the emotional aspect, I mean, roughly put, and, and I uh, have uh, the authority of my colleague who's a biological anthropologist here to back this with. Uh, so the emotional aspects of a narrative event are processed by the limbic system, while the, it is the function of the cerebral cortex to adjudicate when, where, and if the event actually took place. And what is important is that the limbic system is much older and more basic than the cerebral cortex in evolutionary terms, which allows it to often overwrite what the cortex suggests. And this relationship is uh, often metaphorically portrayed uh, through this metaphor of uh, an elephant and its rider. So the rider is the conscious verbal thinking brain, the cortex, and the elephant is the limbic system, the automatic emotional visceral brain. So. Perched atop the elephant, the rider holds the reins and seems to be the leader. But the rider's control is precarious because the rider is so small relative to the elephant. Anytime the six-ton elephant and the rider disagree about which direction to go, the rider is going to lose. He's completely overmatched. Most of us are all too familiar with situations in which our elephant overpowers rider. You've experienced this if you've ever slept in, overeaten, dialed up your ex at midnight, procrastinated, tried to quit smoking and failed, skipped the gym, got an angry and said something you regretted, abandoned your Spanish or piano lessons, refused to speak up in a meeting because you were scared, and so on, right? So that's the, so that's the relationship. And it would seem then that what happens when you read an effectively charged story is this, however much your cerebral cortex insists that your reaction to the story in question is inappropriate and unreasonable, since the force behind the reaction is a six-ton monster, such admonitions must be in vain. And that uh, applies not only to uh, you know, moral stories like the animal stories, but also to the phenomenon of us being scared of uh, while watching a horror movie, right? So cerebral cortex says, bro, ease up, zombies ain't real. <laughs> But the limbic system is like scary, run away, yeah, and so on. So that is the that is the thing, and and this is what happens in the case of the fiction non nonfiction thingy, and and why this is important. Now, uh, it has this has practical implications because one reason to think that literary narratives may be a valuable tool in influencing the public's concern about animal welfare is that thanks to their aesthetic appeal, they can make the topic of animal plight interesting, even to those people who would otherwise refuse to know more about it, out of the fear that this could cause them to too much distress or make them uh, feel guilty. And there are such people. You tell them, hey, watch this footage from, from a slaughterhouse. They would say, no, I don't, I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. And, there are, and, and there's even one American organization called Farm uh, that they are paying people money to watch it. So they have this video bus and they you know, go around the states and they stop somewhere and say, watch a video, uh, animal you know, slaughter video and we'll pay you a dollar or something like this. This is how difficult it is to convince people. But here you have a literary narrative. It has an aesthetic frame, for example, of a detective fiction story and people read it uh, because they wanna know the, the cool story. So this is it. And it is reasonable to assume that the capacity, that capacity of literary narratives would be even more pronounced in the case of literary stories that are perceived as fictional. Because if you think that a story of animal suffering is fictional, you should definitely express such fears to a lesser degree than you would in the case of a story you thought was real. And the good news brought by our results is that such a hypothetical effect would not come at the price of decreased persuasiveness. As we have just shown, the attitudinal impact of an animal story does not depend whether, on whether you perceive it to be fictional or not. And this is my, uh, now comes my second example, my final example. And it, uh, this example is related to our story and extinction narratives. So you have, uh, I'm sure you've seen, read a lot of those. There are stories about extinction, endangered species. And again, they are used by all kinds of organizations. Here's, a, here's a, um, an article from World Economic Forum 
uh, on World Wildlife Day, 10 conservation stories that will fill you with hope, plenty of those, right? Use in order to stow support for conservation efforts. And such stories are uh, of interest to scholars in, within the environmental humanities, in particular in extinction studies, this is a foundational volume of ext in extinction studies. And as you can see, it even has stories in its subtitle. Stories are immensely important for extinction studies scholars. So we did a study on, on, on the impact of extinction stories. And in particular, and it was published in Isle. That's the flagship journal of the Association for the Study of Literature and the Environment, like probably the, the largest, the most important uh, ecocritical organizations, organization. and, and the, the study, Extinction Stories Matter, the Impact of Narrative Representation of Endangered Species Across Media, it compared, we wanted to see whether the effect of, uh, uh, we, we had this question yesterday, actually, right? Why you study literature, right? Print, why not TikTok or whatever, other media? So we, we wanted to study different media. So we had, uh, so in our study, we randomly divided our participants into four groups, a control group and three experimental groups with each of the, the experimental groups being presented with the same extinction narrative, albeit articulated in a different medium. So we had a print, uh, medium, video, and audio. So we had like, uh, uh, so it was based on a, <clears throat> on, on a story from CNN, and we created a, a, an audio version of it and, and, uh, and the print version. And uh, we also had the privilege of uh, working on that study. And I was glad she accepted with a famous Polish voiceover artist, like, you know, imagine like David Attenborough, right? It's just like he does voiceover for all kinds of nature documentaries. So she's like the Polish David Attenborough. So when people hear her voice, so she's used in commercials for that purpose, they immediately uh, associate that with nature documents. She agreed and, and we, we had their, her on board. And so that this design would yield sufficiently informative results, we chose to measure participants' responses with an instrument's instrument typically used for such purposes in the social sciences, a set of questioner items called scale. So, uh, and I'm talking about the details of the study because I, I hear, I, I heard from, from, from Panu Tony and, and Oli that many people just simply want to know how it's done, like empirical uh, eco-criticism. So you have, I'm, I'm, that's why I'm talking about the instruments too. So you had, so in our scale, we followed the commonly accepted view that attitudes consist of three major components. Emotional, that is feelings or emotions linked to an attitude object. Cognitive, the beliefs, thoughts, and attributes we associate with an object. And behavioral, the willingness to act with regard to an object. So our scale consisted of the following three items. It upsets me, it upsets me I'm sorry, that various species are endangered as a result of human activity. That was the emotional component to capture, uh, and aimed to capture the emotional component. We had, uh, an item that aimed to capture the cognitive component, endangered species should be protected by the law, and the behavioral component, I would sign a petition in support of endangered species. Uh, and as to our results, first of all, and I'm, we, we had all kinds of results, but I'm talking here, uh, I told you that I'll be, uh, I want to give you some examples of counterintuitive or, or puzzling results. So first of all, our analysis showed that the media influenced the participants' responses such that those watching the video and those listening to the radio narrative showed greater concern for endangered species than the participants reading the print stimulus and those in the control group. And there was no difference uh, between the, the audio and the video stimulus. And I'll get to that, it's just, it's pretty puzzling. Uh, and they also showed that a high score on the emotional dimension of attitudes toward endangered species does not mean one score on cognitive and behavioral components will be high too. So we had like, uh, the narrative just just you know in one case the the uh, in one case the the added the emotional component was just was just super high, but nothing changed. Uh, but cognitive and behavioral uh, components were not high at all. So there was this disproportion, and that was that was really intriguing. So the lack of difference between the radio and video stimulus is intriguing given that video messages are generally seen as more persuasive than audio messages, right? Something which is attributed both to the fact that vision is the dominant sensory modality for humans and to the fact that video messages typically involve both visual and auditory aspects, thereby providing a fuller sensory experience than audio messages. And anybody tell you, you know, radio broadcast should be less persuasive than, than a YouTube video or, or a TikTok for, for, that, for that reason. But, 
One possible explanation is that while video stimuli are perhaps on average more persuasive than audio stimuli, that difference might have been leveled out in our case because all our stimuli contain graphic details uh, and it can be less confronting to simply imagine what those details look like than to be shown visual images of them. So these were, for example, you know, uh, slaughtered you know, horses, right? So given this, it is reasonable to assume that some participants in the video condition might have been put off by the images and as a result, mentally distanced themselves from the story and its message rather than becoming absorbed in the former and taking in the latter. And our, so, so this was, so this is something that, 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 that was intriguing and it tells you, look, not, do not always go for a video. Other uh, apparently less flashy, you know, le less attractive uh, uh, media might be, might be more persuasive. And our results also suggest that the relationship between how upset we are that various species are endangered as a result of human activity and whether we think that endangered species should be protected by the law or whether we would sign a petition in support of endangered species is not as close as it might seem. The same might be true for uh, the relationship between the effective cognitive and behavioral components of attitudes toward endangered species more generally. And very often you have uh, narratives that uh, want to aim at emotions uh, 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 mainly, right? So, and we just show that even if you have the effect, you move people emotionally without sufficient stimulation of, of cognitive and behavioral attitudes, this will not work. So these are, these are, so this was also something that we didn't expect and we think is relevant for uh, both in scholarly and practical terms. And right now we're applying these kind of methods to other kinds of narratives. I uh, last year I got a large grant again from the National Science Foundation uh, Science Center. Thank you, National Science Center, uh, for supporting this this research on climate fiction as environmental communication, and and we're studying the impact on beliefs, attitudes, and, and behavior. And uh, I'm again privileged to to be able to work with. Uh, very brilliant people, and this is my team. You get Matthew, whom you know very well, uh, Jagadish Thacker from University of Queensland, who is an environmental communication scholar. And uh, we also, and, and Jagadish uh, is here also because he's a specialist on, on climate attitudes in, in India. And in this particular project, we wanted to expand the cultural and ethnic scope of our sample. So uh, we have participant studies that are designed to have participants from Poland, uh, that's a Western country, uh, uh, but Eastern European, uh, economically different from the US, from, from which uh, some of our other participants come from. And we also have participants from India. So it's a culturally diverse uh, 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 sample. And we are going to compare, we're talking here about uh, different cultural factors and contexts that might influence the impact of such stories. And we, we compare. And again, I, I, uh, I'm privileged to work with Piotr Sorokowski, who's, who's an experimental social, social psychologist, uh, with Viktoria Yandrychka, who's, who's our uh, research assistant. She's also a social psychologist. My colleague, Dorota Kowojicic, who's, a, who's an expert in post-colonial theory. So we have this component because we work with narratives that, that deal with India and, and uh, empirical criticism, what uh, its unique contribution and what it, uh, what differentiates it from uh, uh, environmental communication or environmental psychology is that we do, it's our intention to take into consideration various formal, but also cultural and political features of those narratives. And we have the post-colonial perspective there too. And uh, again, we're working with a writer, uh, Will Buckingham. Uh, he's a British uh, author who recently has been doing very well. I mean, uh, after he accepted my invitation, he got big. I don't know if he would have accepted that before that, but now his stuff is covered by the BBC. But, but we have Will on board and we uh, haven't started conducting our studies yet. I'm very excited about uh, uh, the forthcoming results and, and we'll be happy to share them with uh, you uh, later. And if you wanna know more about uh, empirical criticism, again, this is our website. It's got all kinds of resources, uh, links to, to our papers. And you can learn more about the stuff, also also experimental stuff from our website. And that is all uh, that I have for you. I mean, I have empirical evidence that I should be finishing right now. Uh, my time is up. So kitos, thank you so much. Thank you. And then Elisa, it's your turn. 
Thank you. I hope that you can hear me well. Um, thank you for a very impressive uh, lecture. And also my gratitude um, is towards your brilliant work. Um, you sent me some articles and your book and I read them all and I am thoroughly um, impressed. So, so thank you for this um, groundbreaking work that you are engaging in. I'm sorry I could not be there in person. I have to be in central Finland looking after my father who has severe Alzheimer's and uh, it was a slight emergency um, situation. So unfortunately I could not be there. Um, I would very much have loved to be there. Um, I've been listening to some of the talks online and many of them have been deeply engaging and um, something that touches my own work in, in various ways as well and, and raises uh, curiosity. So uh, it's a shame I could not be there, but I will give you a comment uh, via, via Zoom. Um, now, let's see. So, again, I have to say I really liked your lecture it was, uh, uh, and your work. It's, uh, it's something that I'm um, very fascinated with. When I was younger and had just started to deliver public lectures on animal ethics, I came across a baffling phenomenon. Regularly, an attendee would approach me after the lecture with the following, following comment. I agree with the argument you presented, but I still remain unconvinced. I had been trained as an analytic philosopher, reliant on the rationalist method, which states if you offer people logical arguments, they will be persuaded. Such a method stems, of course, from the classics of Western philosophy, such as Socrates, who famous, famously argued that immorality is ignorance, and that as soon as people are given relevant knowledge, they will behave morally. Surely then, I thought, as soon as people are offered solid arguments in favor of treating non-human animals better, they will act accordingly. The world will become vegan. So which part of the argument do you hesitate with? I would ask these attendees. None was the usual response. I see that the argument is correct, but I still remain unpersuaded. I remember glaring at one such person with some amount of frustration in my eyes. What does that even mean? I asked him. I don't know, you are the philosopher, so I thought you could help, he responded. Idiot, I thought silently, and moved on without realizing that if anyone was foolish in this instance, it was me. I'd still to learn the power of emotions in moral decision-making. I partly blame my education for that. In analytic philosophy, there was, and still is, a very strong tendency to overlook the role of emotions in human decision-making. I was taught that morality is about reason, not emotions, and if emotions had any influence, one was to quickly erase it. Paying any emphasis on emotions was an intellectual mistake. In his dialogue Protagoras, Plato had used the classic example of a chariot in which reason controls emotions, and this example was sketched into my mind as a young student. The power of the example was so strong that I recoiled when hearing of a woman who had written her philosophy PhD on love. On love, I remember squeaking, a female philosopher writing about love. Oh, the shame. Behind the chariot stands a rationalist understanding of human nature. Humans are often depicted as the supreme species, the superiority of whom stems from high reasoning ability. Many recognize that we share affects and emotions with other animals, whereas reason is thought to belong to homo sapiens only. Whilst crows follow instincts and feelings, human beings can step back and think. This means that our uniqueness as a species, and indeed the narrative of what it means to be a human being, is grounded on rationality. Without this belief in reason, we lose the Western story of who we are as a species. Ironically then, from the purpose of the present context, 
a given narrative of both philosophy and humanity had led me into believing that, contrary what Beatles would like us to think, reason is all you need. Following suit, I decided to dedicate my life to presenting people with rational arguments on behalf of treating non-human animals better. However, the more I labored with delivering these arguments, the more frequent became the bewildered comments. Yes, yes, I see that you are right, but something is missing. On one occasion, this comment came from a student who approached me after a talk, talk I had given at the university in Vienna. Could you help me, please? She asked with some amount of desperation. I have presented animal ethical arguments to my partner and he accepts them, but still refuses to give up meat. He says the reason is that he just does not care. How could I make him care? She asked. Finally, I understood the question. Care, people do not care. Certainly, the female philosopher writing about love did not seem quite such a shameful character. Maybe she was onto something after all. I began reading about care ethics and getting familiar with philosophy of emotions. The more I read, the more obvious it became that emotions surpassed reason. Today, many empirical studies manifest that human decision making, including moral choices, stems from emotions rather than rational deliberation. Philosophers are wrong. Indeed, most of the values and norms we routinely follow are something which we have never rationally analyzed. This is the cause of those awkward moments where we may fail to defend even our most basic moral intuitions against an eager and skillful critic. Yet next to reason and emotion, there is a third element at play, namely stories. As Professor Maleczki beautifully manifests, behind our emotions and moral attitudes stand narratives which we learn from the surrounding culture. As he argues in his work, human attitudes towards other animals are often disorganized and even peculiar, as people may both hold animals in greater value than fellow human beings, and yet treat them as pieces of meat. Maleczki's suggestion is that it is precisely narratives which, ex which explain this disarray. The stories we learn are contradictory with one another. One story may guide us to care and another may urge us, to, um, urge us toward systemic aggression. In short, stories have the power to make us believe that pigs and foxes are intelligent creatures worthy of care, or conversely, that they are purely instinctual biology invested with only instrumental value. It is because of their power that narratives concerning on other animals deserve more scholarly attention. As Maleczki writes, narratives create ideologies and indeed identities, and they often shape our attitudes and moral values. It appears evident that they also lie behind the anthropocentric worldview with its insistence on human supremacy. Interestingly, it is often what lies outside of narratives which has the greatest impact. That which narratives exclude becomes, I think, its own meta-narrative, which signifies to us what is important and what is not. The fact that there are relatively few archetypal narratives on how to care for non-human animals gives us the impression that those animals are unimportant. When novels, films, television, television series and art remain silent about non-human creatures, we learn the meta-narrative that they have no relevance. I will give you the example of love. I have elsewhere argued that for instance, love as also I became the female philosopher who writes about love, requires narratives. Studies show that we tend to make sense of morally pertinent emotions such as love by culturally acquired stories. Love stories teach us how, whom, and when to love, not only in the romantic, but most importantly in the moral sense of the term. When there are relatively few stories circulating in the contemporary Western cultures on how to undergo moral love towards non-human animals, such love remains scarce and often belittled, as 
animal lovers frequently appears both sentimental and slightly unhinged. This again leads to the following meta narrative. Loving animals is, is, is eccentric or naive and not something that serious rational adults should engage in. It is precisely these sorts of narratives that lead to, lead to some that lead uh, to some to say that at the face of rational arguments, I remain unconvinced. The arguments go against the narratives that people have learned and the type of emotions those narratives entwine with. If cultural narratives do not teach us to care about non-human suffering, a philosophical argument on behalf of animal rights, no matter how logical, will evidently uh, and in inevitably seem unpersuasive. It is because of this that we need significantly more stories on both animals and how to care for them. And why we also need much more research into the role of narratives in our moral landscape, including empirical uh, research. Professor Malechki is doing pioneering work of tremendous value on this front, and I want to thank him once more for his brilliant presentation and his highly important scholarly um, research. I have one question uh, for him, for you. You focus mainly on how narratives may evoke empathy towards other animals, but what about other moral emotions such as guilt, anger or love? Do you think we should have more cultural narratives that invite people to undergo these emotions in the context of uh, animal ethics? And have you considered um, doing uh, experimental research on this front? Thank you. Thank you, Elisa. Ex excellent commentary. Thank you, Elisa. That was, that was touching and very informative. And, uh, Thank you so much for, for uh, uh, this means a lot to me. And thank you so much for sharing your personal story of, of a philosopher. I have to say that I part of my background is in philosophy and I was there, but I was lucky enough to be introduced to philosophy through neo-pragmatism that developed uh, in opposition to analytic philosophy that makes that uh, argument against arguments in ethical persuasion making from the very beginning. So, but I just wanted to first, before I answer your question, which is which is very important, then uh, I, I wanted to just add a bit of uh, psychological theory to what you were talking about. And, and, and just, just so that it's clear, I know you know about this research, so it's not that, 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 that I'm trying to, uh, mm, Enlighten you of this. I'm just. I, I just wanted to. I just wanted to add uh, that comment in general. So, so uh, what you said is uh, confirmed by by research in moral psychology, for example, by Jonathan Haidt, which uh, shows that uh, our moral attitudes are based on a set of brute intuitions uh, that. Mm, on which uh, I mean, and and all the arguments that we have for our moral intuitions are just uh, second order rationalizations. So there are brilliant studies in which he shows that people, when people are even are shown that all their arguments are crap for supporting their intuition, they still hold on to this. So this, he did a brilliant study on people's intuitions against uh, incest. Uh, he, he asked his participant, let us imagine a hypothetical scenario. You got two young people who are siblings and they have sex. And imagine it causes no psychological trauma. There will be no unwanted pregnancy. Nobody will know about it. They will forget about it. Just imagine this situation. It's just one off thing and, and nothing happens, no consequences. Do you think it's wrong? Yeah, I think it's wrong, but why? And then they come up with arguments that relate to those considerations that were excluded. No, 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 this is excluded. Are you still against that? Yes, I am. So they, he, get, he gets to that position where people are just table thumping. Yes, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. I don't know why this is wrong. So this is so in a way, and he presents that in the paper where he says that this is this is the uh, emotional tail wagging the the rational dog, and that that's true. It's 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 all so so. What you have here, uh, so what you have here is uh, a situation where you know you talk to people who uh, had the wrong kind of intuitions. You presented them with arguments. Those arguments destroyed their own arguments, but they still didn't feel it. So that, that was the case. But there are also, so uh, 
arguments, but it's not that arguments never work. So there is a situation like, I don't know, there, there's this book by Peter Singer, Animal Liberation. It's all arguments, right? And it succeeded in convincing a lot of people to, to change their attitudes toward animals, started animal rights uh, uh, liberation movement. Why is that? I mean, my theory is that there are certain people who have the right kind of intuitions, but they were socialized into a culture that denies those intuitions, right? Or they cannot really articulate their intuitions. They were taught something different. So when they encounter a philosophical argument, this might make them understand what they felt from the very beginning, but could not articulate. So th there's that limited power just, 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 to, just to admit that arguments can make some, some, some uh, but too little of it. You need to change people's intuitions. And when you ask people, when you ask people who, uh, underwent a moral conversion or religious conversion for that matter, because this is the similar thing. I think Panu as a theologian might, so it's always that something dramatic happens, right? They will tell you, I saw this, I experienced that, and this is a major change. And you cannot really use that as an instrument, but narratives are a proxy for this. So you simulate those kind of experiences, this is why they may change your intuition. So that's the power of narrative. So that's that's just a psychological twist on, on what you said. I fully agree. And 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 I really love your your personal story and frankness about the, the failure to use uh, arguments. And and as to uh, why and if we did why we didn't focus on any other kinds of emotions. So one of these things is related to a very practical uh, consideration. When you do empirical research, uh, you have to focus, and this is what I learned from colleagues in social science. I had like tons of ideas. Let's check this, let's check this. I had a whole list of like 50 hypotheses and they were like, stop, stop. You just focus on this. Let's do studies that are related to this phenomenon. So this is just a, just when you do, and you wanna get funding for this kind of thing, you have to limit yourself to this. But I agree, there are other kinds of emotions that are taught in, in, in the feminist ethics of care and, and virtue ethics, Martha Nussbaum, right? It's, it's anger and so on. So this is, this, is very, this is very important. And actually uh, we are going to study those other emotions. Uh, I didn't think about love. I've, I've been doing some research on the psychology of love, but that's good. I've, I've, I'm going to, uh, that, that's, thank you for this, that I'm, I'm going to incorporate that. But what we're going to, uh, as part of that climate fiction project, we're going to talk about other emotions than, than, than empathy too. So this is, this is, so I'm trying to expand uh, uh, that scope now, thanks to this, this other grand money. But, but I also wanted to, to, uh, it was a very important uh, comment that you made that about love, how difficult it is to say that you love animals. How, you know, it's just like when you people, I care for animals, I sympathize with them. People will say, understood, this is, this is good, right? But when you say, I love animals, right? Then you immediately are, you know, just uh, wishy-washy, tree hugger, thingy, and so on. It's very, for some, especially for men, it, it would be difficult to, to admit that. And uh, and this is again a sort of uh, implicit meta narrative, right? That there's something that there's something wrong about this, and that was a brilliant point. And uh, and I have to share with you, we did a study on different kinds of narratives uh, than uh, those that present animal suffering, and that appeal primarily to empathy. I mean, this kind of empathy, where in mean, sympathy, caring for. So we compared the the effects of uh, of uh, narrative that depicted animal cruelty, but we also had a, a brilliant narrative about a positive relationship between uh, a human being and a horse, how they come to understand. It was not about love, about friendship. It was very positive. I thought this was touching and the results were crushing. So the, the, there, was no, there was no change in attitudes toward, toward non-human animals after people have read those, that positive story. Uh, but there was a change when they read that story of, of, of cruelty and they were made to sympathize and so on. Maybe that was just a one-off study. Maybe, the, maybe there was something wrong with the story itself, that positive story. But then we did a study which, which turned out the, the cruel or the, the, the animal story. So, so, so uh, uh, it, it is the, the more powerful the effect is. So maybe there's this, there's also, and this, that's maybe also a danger in stories that we are socialized into liking stories and there are also evolutionary reasons for this that focus on danger, pain, suffering. And, and there are evolutionary psychologists, this is how they, you know, if you just look at the stories you like, every, every one of you, your favorite story, 
they are all full of death, suffering, illness, and so on. You just take anything, like the Harry Potter thingy. You get a boy, his parents were killed, he's chased by an evil wizard, people get killed, limbs are broken, constant anguish, suffering, and we're just, we're just predisposed to, to those kind of things. And maybe, maybe uh, uh, that's why we, we got this result, but, but that doesn't mean we, we have to, uh, we shouldn't study it because the focus on, on this, on cruelty and pain uh, has its own uh, drawbacks. So that's, that's very important. I really, really appreciate that. And, and as I said, again, I'm going to expand the scope of, of, of uh, uh, emotions that I study in, in my current project. And, and uh, I will study love. That's, that's, let's, let's end my comment on this, on this positive note. Thank you so much again. Thank you. And thank you. I just briefly will say that that was a uh, beautifully expressed um, uh, comment. So there were so many things there that I, I wish I had recorded this, but you are recording this uh, lecture, so maybe I can get access to it later. But you, you, there were important points that you made there. Um, I just wanted to say that what he, your work has made it obvious to me why my own most recent work on animal studies has been uh, uh, received differently. So I wrote a book on um, called Essays on Animals last year, and it's it's in different style. It's not an academic book. It's a very personal book, and I give a narrative of myself as a, as somebody who grew up in the countryside, surrounded by hunting and uh, agriculture, animal agriculture, and I um, it's it's like um. Uh, it's, a it's a typical narrative where one um, grows as a person and, and becomes um, adopted a given set of moral beliefs and a, and a given ideology and an identity. And there's a lot of depiction of, of suffering in that book. And many readers have said that it's tremendously difficult to read, that they cannot read it at, at, at a pace. They have to put the book away for a few weeks and then return to it. Uh, but at the same time, it's it's my most read book by far. And it has received, I mean, it, it has sold uh, pretty well in, in a comparatively small market because it, it's in Finnish. Um, I, I was surprised how well it has sold. And to me, that um, combination between uh, suffering and, and people complaining that there's the harrowing scenes of the book are too much for them. And at the same time, they are wanting to read it is, a, is an odd mixture. But what you just said there makes sense to me. And also perhaps um, the fact that, that, uh, that I add a personal story to the book makes the suffering more easily um, kind of um, processed. So people can process it via this salvation story of an individual who, who um, comes to terms with all the neglect and abuse animals have to confront and then tries to do something about it. So, so I think that I'm trying to, what I'm trying to say is that perhaps the awfulness of suffering and, and how people often cringe at the thought of having to see images of animal suffering or read stories about animal suffering, how that is made easier for them via personal narratives where a human being offers their own narrative. Um, so it's not only stories about animals that work well, like Black Beauty, which you use an example, but also stories of human beings who do something about animal suffering. And I think that that has, um, yeah, I think that, that that explains why quite a few people have said that it was a life changing event for them to read the book because they said that they felt less lonely as a result, that they could identify with the story uh, and, and with me. And, and therefore, the harrowing scenes became more easily uh, confronted. Does that make sense to you? Oh, that makes perfect sense to, uh, to me, and congratulations uh, on, on the impact your book uh, has made. And I'll just, uh, talking too much, I need to shut up, but I'll just say this, this phenomenon that you're describing, uh, we worked with a few texts that, that uh, adopt this perspective. You can say that's a 
that's kind of meta uh, empathy. So you empathize both with the animal and also with the human being, human protagonist empathizing with the animal. So this, in this way, this is this is uh, your your empathy is amplified. Uh, and 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 uh, the story by Alice Walker and My Blue. And also we worked with a story by Dostoevsky, you know, the famous Raskolnikov's famous nightmare, where he uh, dreams that he's a child and he uh, is watching a horse being beaten. And what's powerful, that that story would not be so powerful if you didn't at the same time empathize and sympathize with that little child who just says, you know, grabs his hand by the hand, what are they doing to this poor horse? And it's just like, uh, amplifies the whole thing and it channels your empathy so i think i think you're right that makes perfect sense to me uh you know the, your story just worked through uh this meta empathetic uh mechanism thank you thank you so much thank you before we move to the general uh discussion i have one comment uh that uh spontaneously came to me after listening elisa's Commentary. Uh, you're probably right. We don't have that much meta narratives that uh, deal with uh, uh, love between. Yes, thanks. That deal with love between uh, human and non-human. But one came up to my mind, which, which is a uh, um, friendship between a child and an animal. And this is an archetypal story that is retold generation after generation in children's books. Of course, it's a, it's a the, the, the rarely include adult characters or protagonists, but it's still the adults that write these books in order to implant this love between uh, human and non-human younger children. But then, I'm sure you have lots of questions and comments for both Wojciech and Elisa, please, Jan. Thanks uh, to both of you. Very interesting discussions. Um, I have um, a comment and a, and a question to Wojciech. Um, the, the comment is really um, about uh, the controlled experiments. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll start with a, a story. Uh, I talked about the policy operations room experiments. And they're really work intensive. I mean, you have to contact high level policymakers and, and persuade them to come together and spend three hours or more uh, together and to deliberate. So it's, you can't do, we did uh, eight of them during six years. So you can't do a controlled experiment. We talked about it, we decided, well, <laughs> I mean, so there's so, so much work, we can't do it. So then I looked up a little bit in, in methodology and there's, uh, there are articles, I found one really interesting in on, on uh, uh, controlled experiments versus design experiments. And I realized that, okay, we're doing design experiments. So a design experiment is where you, you create a loosely, you are designing a thing. So we were designing a thing called a, a decision-making platform. And then, then you said, it's like building a cupboard or something, how, how, how you do carpentry. And you kind of know what the cupboard looks like. So you do a first version, then you test it and then you improve it. So there's some prior knowledge, there's some kind of objective, but they both sort of, they're in a feedback. And so I think that's kind of, but I think there's an interaction between control, what you are saying, provides exactly the solid data on which to start designing something. And I think this is where you get the, the, the nice um, feedback between those different kinds of experiments. The question is really that uh, in doing this, this dashboard, we, this relates to your point that, you know, you're finding that the fictions, that it doesn't really matter fiction or, or nonfiction, the influence doesn't really change. But what, do you think that the audience actually uh, does have, it depends on the audience, what the audience is. In other words, so we sort of felt that, or we experienced in the dashboard, the first dashboard, so well, the, the, the factual 
is important, but it's not enough. So we want sort of factual plus effective stuff. Um, and, and I think the factual is important. It was really, our interpretation, it was really important that, for example, the storm that we brought, it's, it happened somewhere else, but pretty near, um, uh, not so, so long ago. And that sort of created for these experts and policymakers that, okay, they're not eventing it. <clears throat> they're not, it's not just a story. Mm -hmm. It's, it's something that's, so it's, I'm wondering if, if the audience is actually, uh, influencing. Yeah. yeah, good question. So, uh, I mean, shall we gather more questions or should I reply directly? Yes. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, so, um, yeah, I, I appreciate uh, what you said about controlled experiments. In our case, uh, it's not like you, our participants, were policymakers where it's extremely difficult to get these people together. And, and uh, we worked with uh, students and so on and, and, and other people. And, and, uh, and we used the, the, mm, the popularity of Marek Krajewski to get his readers on board. So, so, we, 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 so it wasn't dif that difficult for us to, to have controlled experiments. And on the other hand, when you work on stuff that may seem pretty, uh, let's say suspicious to hard-nosed social scientists, you have to have like hardcore controlled experiments. So this is what we did. And, and right now we're working, and for any of you who you know, might be cautious about doing experiments, these days you can hire, uh, you, you can use platforms such as Prolific or MTurk or just hire a market research agency who will help you for a fee, of course, but to, to, to conduct those experiments online. But, but um, yeah, I agree that uh, it may depend on uh, uh, the audience and the framing, and it's different when you present policymakers with a hypothetical story that is framed as, uh, let's say, uh, a policy story, but they might be also influenced if they read in their spare time, like a like a fiction, fiction climate fiction book about floods. And then I would recommend, uh, for example, uh, uh, 40 Signs of Rain by, by Kim Stanley Robinson, which deals with climate change and floods, and it's very, very well researched. But, but also, uh, even fiction readers, they, they pay attention to whether a novel has been researched thoroughly. You know, it's just like very often writers have those afterwards would say, by working on this book, I did research and so on and so on. And we actually have an experiment designed in, in the, the, so thank you for the question. It just uh, made me realize this kind of stuff may, may interest people. We have an experiment where we control for how people perceive an author, whether the author did his research on, on, on the fictional story, uh, whether it's science-based or not. So let's, let's, put it, let's put it that way. And, and we'll see, I'll be happy to share the results. Thank you so much. Yeah. Other questions? Well, thank you for the talk and also for the very interesting comment on that. Uh, I have actually two questions um, and I would like uh, you uh, to ask um, whether you can show the figure again uh, with the path. Um, I, uh, it was so fast, I couldn't <laughs> write it down, but uh, I had this uh, the other a need and then empathy, but um, the rest, uh, yeah, that one, yeah, great. Um, yeah, I was wondering actually uh, whether you um, also uh, included control variables uh, to see whether um, yeah there are different um, paths or um, maybe other indirect effects uh, here. Uh, for example, um, identification. Uh, Elisa also mentioned, uh, for example, that uh, it made it uh, so much easier um, for her readers to identify uh, with her uh, through her personal story. And um, in psychology, uh, identification is a very strong predictor. Um, uh, so um, that was one uh, question, um, but also personal norms, social norms, um, and other control variables. Um, yeah, that would be the first question. Okay. Uh, and um, the other uh, question was, um, 
uh, during the last two days, uh, we heard a lot about negative emotions um, and narratives and storytelling. And um, I pretty much appreciated uh, the um, notion of uh, hope and also love and love. Um, because um, negative emotions we know um, from literature and um, on um, the willingness on, uh, to participate in social movements, for example, that um, anger can be a good motivator to participate in demonstrations or other forms of political engagement, um, but it can also backfire because if people uh, feel too guilty or too helpless, um, because of what they hear, um, then uh, it can lead them to do nothing anymore. Uh, in various uh, positive emotions, uh, and there's a growing literature, at least in uh, psychology, um, can uh, foster uh, also pro-social and pro-environmental behaviors. Uh, much better, no, not much better, but uh, in another way, and uh, at least not frustrating. Um, and um, I would be interested in whether there are also uh, empirical uh, studies um, that show um, um, that um, positive emotions uh, transported through narratives uh, has uh, the same effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Great comment. Uh, yeah, so first of all, about controls. I mean, the identification, that's a great question. So, um, you know, in my uh, so I assume, so, so that was one of my hypotheses, is that the the impact of those kind of stories will depend on how close a given animal, uh, the species of a given animal is perceived to be in evolutionary terms to humans. So we had, you know, all kinds of, uh, we had we had all kinds of animals, but it's typically, you know, you know stories like a horse or a dog and whatever but but we want i wanted so my hypothesis would be that uh those narratives with protagonists that represent a species that are perceived as you know further away evolutionary will have less impact so that has to do because because it's the studies show that similarity has an impact on 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 empathy so we did a study we took a story by oriana falacci uh the dead body in, in, in uh and the dead brain uh, uh, and um, it was about an animal experiment, about a guy, uh, a, a, a brain surgeon, who actually uh, did studies on brain transplants or had transplants. You know, his idea was that, hey, if you have people suffering from terminal illnesses, there's no cure, then maybe if you tell them, hey, I'm going to transplant your brain or your head to a healthy body, then maybe they would be, you know, they would agree to be safe that way. Sounds like something out of a horror movie, but but he actually, nobody actually allowed him to, to conduct those studies on, on human beings, but they allowed him, that was the 60s, to conduct such studies on animals, including on primates. And they were, and Oriana Falacci attended one of those experiments, and there's this uh, study, uh, there's this, there's this report journalistic story, and, and it is included in, in uh, a brilliant uh, anthology of animal narratives that I wholeheartedly recommend that started other nations, and it was edited by, by Tom Reagan and Andrew Lindsay, the, the famous animal ethicist. But, but anyhow, so we chose that story because the framework of an animal experiment allows you to substitute different kinds of animals for, for the animal protagonist. So we had a whole spectrum from uh, a lizard to a, uh, the, to a chimpanzee. You had birds and so on. So the whole spectrum, I, we worked with a zoologist to, to say that. And our hypothesis was confirmed. So the closer the animal is perceived to be in evolutionary terms to humans, the stronger the effects of, of uh, the ethical effects of a story. And I call it the, the species spectator uh, hypothesis. It's just like, so, so the paradoxical upshot of this is that you can use anthropocentrism of your readers in order to fight their own anthropocentrism. So you have to, you have to, you have to use a protagonist that fits their own anthropocentrism to destroy their anthropocentrism. You shouldn't start with, you know, you, uh, with animals that are too far away. Uh, but then you can move on uh, to 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 uh, to such species. And and yeah, that was that was a that was a fun study to do. And there were also like some some factors that that. Uh, 
that moderated that general effect, like the cuteness effect. So we had a panda. So the panda was like, of course, uh, uh, the story with the panda worked. And, and you know, there's this uh, cuteness effect. We, we are biased to like more and have more empathetic feelings toward uh, beings and objects, really, that resemble human infants. So they even did a study with like, cars you know the, if you look at the cars you know their headlights they, they look very often like faces and those that resemble like little baby faces they 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 like more so so it's just like the, so the cuteness effect and yeah so 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 that's one so controls and also gender you know it turned out that that, that gender was 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 uh, very important women tend to have much better attitudes toward animal welfare and animals altogether uh, toward ex uh, when it comes to conservation, uh, endangered animals, it's just on and on. And you can see that uh, in also in the sociological data on, on uh, participation in, in, in environmental and, and pro-animal movements. So, so we had a lot of, we also controlled for whether people have pets or not, whether they're vegans and so on. So we, we, we did that all. Uh, we did that all. And uh, the second question was about positive emotions. So, uh, and negative emotions. I agree that negative emotions can backfire. That's true. Uh, but we should also be wary of the fact that, you know, of the halo effect of invoking positive emotions, right? Because they are positive. Uh, it's not that they are positive that they have, they can have no uh, negative consequences. They are positive because they feel nice to us. And, and actually research shows that uh, I mentioned that yesterday, but I'm going to repeat myself that the most, if you want to mobilize people, you have to have a combination of positive and negative. If you just give the people hope, they were just like, oh, well, I can sit back and relax, give me my margarita or martini, and I'm just going to, it's going to all be nice and good. If you scare them, they are anxious and they may get paralyzed and so on and so on. So you have, if you combine this, and we did a study of that combined utopian and dystopian uh, narratives and and Sim th th this data that we have on narratives is consistent. Thank you for this. Yeah. Thank you very much for the inspiring and rich talk. I have two questions. Probably the first one is rather a comment, and it's a follow-up comment about empathy and uh, the lack of difference in eliciting strong emotions when reading fiction and non-fiction. So in both cases, it seems to me that the problems are rooted in this uh, very niche of conscious and subconscious or unconscious biases regarding our, our anthropocentric way of thinking. Because when we're arguing about empathy, we're always using this kind of uh, thinking by analogy. And more importantly, we are somehow inclined to feel other beings by analogy with what we understand uh, by humans. For instance, when I feel empathy with a dolphin and it's suffering, I always project my understanding of suffering as a sentient being. Uh, but what about uh, suffering of a river, for example, or suffering of bacteria at first sight, it looks like crazy. Uh, and if you don't have this kind of understanding, actual, ethically gradualized understanding of suffering, which goes beyond this kind of radical anthropocentrism, we basically, we cannot develop feeling of empathy with other natural entities. Uh, so it seems to me that what you said about fighting anthropocentrism could be somehow conducted by introducing the so-called ethical gradualism. And on the other hand, don't you think that there is a risk uh, by trying to transcending this kind of boundaries of anthropocentrism to end up uh, with a certain type of radical biocentrism when we are encouraging this kind of narrative. So how we should put uh, the balance between uh, radical anthropocentrism and radical biocentrism. And the other question is about uh, cerebral cortex. Sorry, I'm not an expert in this kind of area, but I would be interested to see what do you think about measuring moral feelings and moral emotions? Because for example, in neuroethics, there are lots of attempts at measuring empathy and sympathy as produced by animals. And for good or bad, the results are not positive. I mean, uh, they cannot, the researchers cannot end up with some kind of final finding, so to speak. But on the other hand, we still witness particular forms of sympathy and empathy as cultivated by animals. So do you think that when we do this kind of measuring stuff, actually it can contribute to the development of the field? And if so, in what respect? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that's, uh, these are all brilliant questions. So the first thing was, uh, uh, the first thing was about, so, so yeah, you can, you can say, you can say, uh, we worked on extending, and it's an old concept in, in, in morality and ethics, expanding the circle of empathy, right? So it's just, uh, and, and uh, so you can, 
one way in which in which you can describe the the emergence of human rights culture and 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 sort of moral progress that we're seeing in 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 the world is expanding the circle of empathy and and by the way you know first it had to expand from certain social groups to all human groups and so on and now it's re reaching animals by the way i have to tell you that there's this uh, theory it's it's espoused by for example by the harvard historian lynn hunt and she says that for example the emergence of human rights culture in the 18th century, one of the reasons for that was the emergence of the novel as a popular genre. So this was a puzzle, always been a puzzle for historians. Mid 18th century, you had a culture that had nothing to do with human rights, you know, public executions as shows, you know, just like uh, uh, extorting uh, confessions by the police through torture and so on. This, this looked nothing like human rights culture. And then bam, toward the end of 18th century, you have human rights culture. How is that? And so she argues that one of the vehicles for that was the emergence of the novel, because that was a platform for people to empathize with people from other social groups and expand their, but, but I can, I, I agree that, you know, our, the circle that we work with was limited. It didn't. It didn't. Uh, it didn't uh, extend to uh, uh, non-animals, to plants. And and right now, there's very interesting, fascinating work done in plant studies on 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 uh, uh, on the morality of plants and and then uh, their um, nervous system and uh, their uh, experience. And and I agree. Uh, this is this is. It is possible. It is possible to. It is possible to, or I don't know, the coral reef, uh, and it is possible to study that that experimentally. We didn't. We didn't do that. Uh, of course, it's more difficult. Uh, it, it, such effects would be more more difficult. People, a hey, more or less, everybody will believe we need to be good to animals. That's the paradox, right? The, one of the biggest paradoxes. Ask anybody: Are you against animal cruelty? Everybody says, oh my goodness, right? It's just, of course I am. And and then, you know, saying that while eating a hot dog and just, just, just uh, but but it would be difficult, so much more difficult. That doesn't mean uh, uh, we shouldn't be doing this. And that's, 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 uh, uh, that's a potential for further research. Or that's uh, as, as as an academic, I should put it that way. And, and it will be, it will be, it will be great to, to, to do that. As for the, the danger of biocentrism. Uh, theoretically, yes, but practically, I'm a pragmatist. So, so I would just say the danger of this collapsing into some mad form of biocentrism is so low that uh, uh, it's just far more important to counter the actual speciesisms and, and the fact that billions of animals are like a billion pigs are slaughtered each each year and this is this is just like uh this is just like um i would say like make believe threat you know it's just like it's 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 there theoretically but it's virtually impossible for that to occur in any foreseeable uh future and and uh and and one thing that that uh, so so i would just say it's negligible i i, I see uh i see that but but i say it's it's just like it it it, it cannot and, and it won't happen and uh, uh, the last question was, can you can you remind me that was about uh, but yeah, but, uh, I mean, in animals, right, or neurologically. and then yes, that that's uh, that's uh, uh, it is possible. Uh, and there are studies done on uh, the impact of narratives and fiction uh, on brain connectivity. And this is, so it is possible and some results are fascinating because it turns out that when you read a novel, it affects not only those, you know, uh, sectors of your brain that are responsible for, uh, 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 you know, processing words or whatever, but, but also for those parts of the, uh, that are responsible for somesthetics or proprioception, that is the feeling of your own body. So you simulate, you know, uh, you simulate, uh, most likely that's the interpretation, you simulate what's going on in the novel uh, uh, somatically. And, and the funny thing is that these effects last for a week. So you read the novel and your brain is somehow simulating those bodily movements in the back of your head while you're doing shopping or whatever. So, uh, but it's, I agree, it will be fascinating to do that, but 
the one limit is, is getting funding for this. It's, it's, it's just very difficult, fMRI scans and so on. This, this is all uh, very expensive and, and you know, it's, it's, it's very hard to convince people to, to give you that sort of money for, for studying uh, narratives, which is, which is crazy if you consider the fact how important, like Elisa said, it's just like, it's just like how important they are in shaping culture and society. But yeah, thank you. I think it's always fair. Yeah, I have a question concerning facts and fiction. I heard you saying that it doesn't really matter whether the story is, is fictional or factual, right? This is what I heard, okay? Uh, it gets yeah. simplified, yeah. yeah. But if, okay. if I think of another field of human activi activities, like politics, it seems to me like the fiction is doing quite fine. If you think of the dystopian uh, stories about what will happen if we let the migration come in and, and you know that kind of stories, they're doing fine. It, it seems like they're having a great impact for the voters, yeah. you know, globally everywhere. Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, yeah. At, uh, so at the risk of sounding pedantic, I was careful to always say perceived as fictional and perceived as non-fictional because. Because that, for if from a psychological perspective, in those studies, it doesn't really matter if it's actually fictional or not. What matters is if it's perceived as fictional or not. And this is why we could do that study. Certain narratives, if you don't frame, if you don't tell people, look, it's based on facts, they can be read either way. So we read in our experiment as, uh, 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 an, a, a narrative from a, from a journalistic book called Slaughterhouse by Gail Eisnitz, where the journalist in, interviews a convict who was uh, in jail among other, uh, among other things for the illegal slaughter of horses. But when I read it, I said, that, damn, it looks like something straight out of a detective novel and it worked. And just like imagine a detective interviewing a person like this. But, but anyhow, so I agree. There's plenty of it in, in, in uh, uh, politics. And there's even a book uh, by uh, a guy named uh, Salomon or Salomon. I, I, it was published by Verso the leftist publisher, it's called Storytelling, Bewitching the Modern Mind, where he talks about uh, the corrupting uh, influence of narrative storytelling in, in politics. But this is, again, I always tell people, uh, and it's also about empathy. So one example Peter Singer gives uh, of the danger of, of empathy, including narrative empathy, in, in, in a text called The Empathy Trap, he says, look, empathy, precisely because it kind of goes around the, the argumentative processes, it may distort your uh, moral judgments. And I admit there's this danger and see Daniel Batson, the psychologist, he did that study where he, you know, imagine there's a line of people waiting for treatment, like cancer treatment. And the line is organized such that the closer you are to, to the end, I mean, it, it, it's based on how serious your condition is. So you're closer to, to the treatment. And he did a study saying, okay, there's this line of people and in one group, and, and uh, in both groups, uh, 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 participants were told about this line, and then they were uh, presented with a story, a personal story of one of the patients. And they were asked, would you be willing to move that person you know, further up the line, even if you, they knew that it's based on objective uh, factors? And that this is how this this is based on how much people needed the treatment. And in the condition in which people were made to empathize with the story, they were more likely to move that person. So it's clear a failure of moral judgment. And 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 Peter Singer gives the example of a of a story that Donald Trump used about this beautiful uh, beautiful girl uh, who was who was uh, killed uh, shot. You know, uh, accidentally by by an undocumented immigrant, right? And so so, and he used that, and he you know said, "Oh, look at this, right?" And and it didn't matter, says Peter Singer, that you know there were this is this is just a marginal case. Most of these people are you know there were more people who uh, uh, such immigrants who saved uh, American citizens' lives, and it didn't matter. The story would stick in people's heads, and they would he would use that sort of empathy. So, there's there's that thing, but I always say, look, if this these stories are just tools, you can use a knife to 
you know, cut a birthday cake and you can use it to do terrible things. And this is the same thing with stories. And, and they use it for that purpose. I admit that, but then I'm going to use the old Aristotelian argument for rhetorics because Plato didn't like rhetoric, said, like, oh, it's rational, it may distort our judgment. And Aristotle would say, ease up, Plato. This is just too powerful a tool to leave it to the bad guys. And we just, you know, we're, we're, we're just uh, left with no alternative. We just have to use, but thank you all. Yeah. Great, and then Juan. Warm thanks, Wojciech. That was mag magnificent. And also, Elisa, for the great comments. So, this is sounding like some 1960s television character. Sorry for the low voice. A uh, couple of comments for Wojciech and one for you, you both. Um, when studying eco emotions, um, there's also the trouble of how people balance the emotions. What, what do they think they are about? So, I was thinking about that in the this upsets me emotional component in one of your scales. So I think that's not as tricky as asking, for example, have you felt anger in relation to climate change? Because then the anger can be of why of why different kinds of moral outrage or just rage about the whole issue and that sort of thing. But uh, as a comment to some of the difficulties in measuring the emotional component. Uh, for the audio and video, which I think is a very interesting result, I personally I, I, I would agree with the hypothesis uh, that the visual imagery can be so disturbing, and especially because it also, in the case of extinction and in the case of many ecological troubles, reminds of death and mortality and suffering. So it also goes to these things studied by the terror management theory, theory people and mortality salience and, and so on. There's many kinds of research there, but I think that might be one reason that the visual imagery can be so, so powerful. Uh, but then uh, this thing which is also related to Elisa, I try not to speak too long about this, but since you draw the ball about religion also here, I think the a phenomenon of ecological or animal rights awakenings and epiphanies is highly interesting. And there's some scholarship about this in the religion and ecology field. And we have some prominent examples of people who have had transformative experiences and then become very ardent, either environmental activists, researchers, or animal rights uh, activists. Aldo Leopold is one classic example of seeing the fierce green light uh, in the dying wolf's eyes, which then changed um, many things in, in, in him. And this has functional similarities with religious phenomena. And if we use the term religion broadly, it's related to that people's meaning systems and so on. And this has been discussed, I know, at least in relation to vegan activists, that if you have a strong awakening to the cause, then what results in your behavior has some similarities with newly joined religious group members, for example, both the good sides and bad sides, I think, eth ethically speaking. So it would be interesting uh, to study these kind of matters also in relation to what Matthew was saying yesterday about the possible ac accumulative impacts of uh, environmental literature. And once again, if we uh, compare this to religion, some people get these epiphanies and awakenings and other people might just join gradually over time as people are now joining uh, vegetarian or even vegan vegan circles and then the functional uh, dynamics are quite quite different so it would be interesting to study and here my knowledge is limited you might help me have people done sort of asking people retrospectively about the influence of texts for example Personally, I can say that the Finnish writer Antti Nylén's text were a final sort of tipping point in the accumulation of me becoming a vegetarian. So I speak also from personal experience of more from the accumulation dynamic than an awakening dynamic. Just wanted to dwell a, a bit on this, and if if you watch and Elisa have comments on this, I'd be very interested. So Elisa, I mean, we go first. Um. Thank you, Pano. That, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, in fact, I was just writing about that to my um, uh, new book, which is uh, which will appear in the autumn. I was writing about the um, experiences of the ineffable. The book is about language and animals. And I, I, there's a chapter there about those things which you cannot express in symbolic language. Um, 
um, unless you divert into art and poetics and so forth. Um, and it's uh, from a perspective of moral philosophy, it's very interesting because one argument is that uh, ordinary things become extraordinary via ineffable experiences. And that ineffable experience can be um, can be uh, a religious experience or what they call in secular terms a peak experience. Um, it can be it, it, it can be um, sublime experiences if you go back to the romantics and um, in all sorts of different cultures and, and also in different historical times there has been discussion on the uh, massive role that these sorts of highly intensive experiences can have on human beings and how they can alter one's life. And there's interesting empirical work on how they can alter one's perception of the environment, for instance. So um, people are more likely to adapt uh, environmentally friendly lifestyle and also think that non-human uh, environments have inherent value if they undergo peak experiences. But this, as far as I know, this has not really been studied in relation to animals uh, and attitudes towards non-human animals. But I think that again, there, uh, the ordinary, let's say a pigeon in the park or the, the pig in the stall uh, becomes extraordinary suddenly why these sorts of epiphanies that something is different, the world appears completely novel, um, everything changes. And how to cause these peak experiences is, is uh, an interesting question. And I think um, in my own work, because I try to engage in activism as well, and I try and persuade people to rethink their attitudes towards non-human animals, this question seems to me uh, as, as a very important one. So I thank you for, for bringing it up. And I think that there's, um, in psychology, there's some literature to suggest that uh, awe or wonder can be uh, the most powerful or elevation that's another term for the same same phenomenon they can be very powerful moral catalysts uh, they can they can evoke moral change and they might be the most powerful moral emotions that we have but it's quite difficult to bring them about it's quite difficult to ignite them without um without falling into some sort of uh, highly and obviously sentimental uh, paths and, and so forth. So I think that the, the task is to combine intellectualism with these sorts of highly intensive life-changing experiences and, and to, to, to at the same time remember the role of the ineffable. So to, to bring this all together in my, in my most recent writing, which is yet to be published, um, I try and engage with this topic and suggest that art is, is one alternative by which, by which to, um, um, well, I think that art is really significant in changing people's perceptions of animals, as long as it's done in a, in a manner that's respectful towards the animals and doesn't view them as, as merely metaphors or, or, or like the side characters of, of the great play in which the human being is always the main character. So as long as the animals are brought forward as subjects in their own right, I think that art can evoke these sorts of ineffable experiences and thereby also uh, evoke um, uh, life-changing moral events in, in one's um, thinking. Uh, so yes, next to narratives, we also need art. Thank you. All right, thanks so much. So uh, as to your questions, first of all, I agree, it's very difficult to study uh, emotions. You have to be very careful, especially when you work with questionnaires. And uh, this is something we, we also had to consider uh, in the book. Uh, that 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 uh, Lisa mentioned human minds and, and animal stories. I have a whole chap methodological chapter where I painstakingly uh, detail how we were careful. So uh, you're right. You know, uh, for example, I, I'm giving a so the first principle of constructing your psychological instruments is whether you, they are not ambiguous, especially the terms that are key to your to your research. And so, for example. Uh, this is an example from the book. Imagine you have an item in the questionnaire, I enjoy uh, watching animals in the wild, right? It's just like, as a measure of uh, 
positive attitudes toward animals. But since enjoyment can, this kind of thing can have a moral or aesthetic uh, uh, value or interpretation, you can imagine uh, both a committed hunter, recreational hunter and an, and an animal rights activist saying yes, because the hunter, of course, he or she enjoys, uh, looks beautiful, aesthetic, uh, but this doesn't, this kind of aesthetic enjoyment doesn't change the fact that they can kill them. And, and for an animal activist, this is the enjoyment that has an ethical character. I'm happy that the animal flourishes and that's that. So, so I agree, you know, this is, this is extremely, we try to be as careful as possible. The other thing is mortality salience or, or, uh, so just, uh, just a comment, there's a theory, uh, and a lot of research has been done in psychology on the effects of reminding you about your mortality. In, in terror management theory. And some of this research actually suggests that when you're reminded about your mortality, you become more moral. It's just like, you know, you have this eternal perspective and, and you, you're thinking how you're going, your life is going to be judged and you become more moral. And, and, and insofar as I know, uh, nobody has done uh, any research on whether, uh, you know, narratives that invoke mortality salience, they, they change people's attitudes toward animal or ecological Things, but that's a that's a very interesting avenue of study. And when it comes to epiphanies, that's important. Uh, and I also appreciate the fact that you mentioned that having epiphanies and and showing a sort of zeal and ardor, uh, it can cut both ways, right? It's just like many people are simply irritated by those activists who will tell you, yes, you know, I had this epiphany and now you have to do this. You'll be as happy as I am and you have to change your life. It's going to be great and so on. And, you know, there are tons of uh, videos on YouTube. Uh, just I wholeheartedly recommend, uh, which is very funny and, and it's good for having a different perspective. What if meat eaters acted like vegans, you know? And, and it's just like, uh, you have a guy who's just, look at this sausage. It is a perfect meat-based substitute for a cucumber. You got to try it. And, so, and, you know, yeah, you're eating those plants. You got to try meat because if you eat plants, your body is two-way alkaline. You know, it's just like that, that kind of thing. So, and there's this joke, you know, how do you recognize a vegan? Don't worry, they will tell you. So, so that, that's the thing. So this may be irritating to some people. And, and some people also, they do not undergo those kind of epiphanies. They're psychologically unable to do so, but that's not a problem. If you look at any successful social movement, you realize that you need both people who, you have both people who undergo these dramatic epiphanies and those people who just, you know, follow, right? They, they, they're, they, they have those incremental changes and that's fine. This is for any social movement. And also narratives help you uh, uh, with, undergoing those epiphanies vicariously. Look, one of the most popular genre of literature, pop psychology of anything, self-help, most of these popular books, they're about somebody are undergoing a change. People love those stories, right? I left, led this life, I was, I was, you know, I don't know, I had those kind of problems, I was deep in the hole. And, you know, the, those books like Unfuck Yourself or something like this, it's just like, and people love those stories. They don't need to undergo an epiphany dramatic change, but they can vicariously uh, do that through other people's stories. And this motivates them to adopt certain incremental changes. So, so I would say, yes, cut both ways. They are important and, 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 and we need both people who just, you know, follow. That's fine. I don't, I'm not a let's say moral purists. I don't require anybody who just could just who just have this this kind of radical change and change everything. You know, that would be yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. It's so interesting with this epiphany. I done some research on uh, um, narratives, uh, storytelling narratives that either, as you say, uh, Wojciech, they tell about the change. But there are also literature that try to stage that and lead the reader, I would say, to that point. And one of those is Kierkegaard, Søren Kierkegaard. I think that was what he was doing in his really intriguing authorship. That is, I mean, people are really trying to understand <laughs> what is his word, and he's constantly... Um, going away from that, the reader has to do something to, to grasp it and it's impossible. And I think he would 
he, he was trying to do that with the reader. And there's also a Swedish author, uh, Lars Hüllenstein, that I was researching and, I, and he copied or imitated that technique and tried to do that in his authorship to stage and provoke the reader to get his, her own epiphany. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very good comment, which reminded me, uh, I mentioned the philosopher Richard Rorty and neo-pragmatist here, and he has this brilliant uh, uh, example of, of uh, how stories can actually simulate this kind of moral experience. And he uses the example of uh, Vladimir Nabokov's novels, uh, Lolita and Pale Fire. And he has, and she's, he argues these are very powerful vehicles of moral education. And he calls them self-consuming artifacts. But he says what happens in that when you read the, the Lolita or Pale Fire is that you are sucked in by the uh, aesthetic beauty of Humbert Humbert, his language, right? And you read that story and you forget or uh, downplay the suffering that he inflicts. And when you get to the end of the story, you're crushed by Nabokov who reminds you you think this is a monster, Humbert Humbert, but in your readerly experience, you recreated that very thing. And you just, and the novel is cleverly constructed so that you're reminded, you're, you're, you're brought, uh, all these threads are brought together toward the end and you just say, oh, Jesus Christ, you know, I'm a monster. This is, this is too. And, and it's a powerful, for some people, and that was for Rorty and, and many other things, that was a powerful uh, um, so narratives can can have uh, because we're talking earlier about you know uh, the complexity of stories and this is this is one this is one example uh, a very nice example literary example both pale fire and and Rorty writes about this and these are very moving texts also uh, because he talks personally about his own experience readerly experience and yeah some of the best philosophical work on literature I've ever read in his book Contingency Irony and Solidarity great stuff I recommend it. We started late, so we have a few extra minutes left. Anton, please. Thanks. Thanks, Wojciech. Uh, and there was much going on. Um, there was many threads, but I, I kind of got stuck on, on your exchange with Orly. I think there was interesting things going on there because, I mean, you talked about the problem of empathy, which I find agreeable, but I think there's a, another problem with empathy that's not, not the epistemic problem that you kind of refer to this, there was this upsurge in research on empathy because there was ideas that, for example, healthcare workers should be schooled in empathy so that healthcare is not only about diagnosing and science, but you should care about, care about the other and uh, feel with the other. But then there was some backlash because if that's what empathy does, I feel with another. And you imagine a healthcare worker telling 10 times a day that you have terminal cancer to somebody, caringly telling this. And of course, this will mess you up personally. You will get burned out or depressed because caring for the other might at some point uh, make it hard for you to care about yourself. So this like real cases of empathy has this, this kind of commitment to something. And because of this, I, I would say that there has to be some kind of categorical difference between empathy for fic fiction, fictitious persons, and empathy for real persons. Uh, I'm not claiming, it might still work the way you, way you explain that, okay, uh, narratives can help us empathize, teach us to empathize, but still there's a very important categorical difference because I don't have to commit my life to fictitious persons, whereas I do have to commit and there's requirements when I deal with real people, and that has psychological consequences that are good, but in some cases also might lead to me stopping caring about myself. So that's mm -hmm. kind of my comment or uh, thinking out loud. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a great comment, and uh, I appreciate it. There is, uh, there is a book written by uh, the American psychologist uh, named Paul Bloom. It's titled Against Empathy. And uh, the book is, uh, was written as a reaction to the sort of empathy culture, you know, 
Barack Obama says, we're going to have better politics if we have more empathy, feel with everybody, and so on. And Paul Bloom, I mean, it's a, it's a kind of rhetorical shtick because Paul Bloom is not against all kinds of empathy. He's only against what is called effective empathy or feeling with, just, just having the same kind of feeling that the other has. And he says exactly the same point, you know, you don't want your doctor, you know, when you go to, go to an emergency room, you don't want the doctor to really feel with you because the doctor then will be terrified and pain. And so when you want the doctor to really treat you as a patient objectively in a cold manner in, in a sense in this way because you want to, you want them to perform their professional duties right not be scared and 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 um, and there's research which shows that people in certain professions uh health workers and so on if they have this uh oversensitive in terms of effective empathy, they, they may get burnout symptoms and so on, it's just too taxing. And, uh, and, and Bloom just wrote the whole book against that form of empathy. And he says, look, what we need is some kind of rational cognitive, cognitive empathy that you can say, you, you can find that in Buddhism, you know, it's just like, yeah, and, then, and that's fine. But, but uh, what I'm saying, I mean, the example, but again, if you, uh, uh, have, uh, but we're using uh, this effective empathy when it comes to stories. Uh, uh, that sort of empathy is not as intense. It will not lead to any burnout. Yet at the same time, because you have the safe space for your emotions, but at the same time, it leads to attitude change. And that's, that is what is important. So narratives allow you to have this effective empathy without the, the, the negative consequences. And there's another thing. There's another thing. There's a theory in evolutionary psychology. I'm sorry, I'm talking too much, but this is, but these are very <laughs> stimul yeah. stimulating questions. But there's this theory in evolutionary psychology. Why or why are we so fond of stories? especially fictional stories. If you consider that you spent a good chunk of your life, just add up all the hours you spent on books, TV series, binge watching, whatever, on watching stories uh, that concern fictional characters and events. It's just like so important, but it's fictional, apparently no practical value. So the theory is that uh, we're hardwired to like stories because they act as a sort of simulator of social life and precisely the fact that we uh and, and they prepare us and th the reason why we like those scary stories difficult stories with with negative emotions is that this kind of narrative this prepares us for encountering such emotions in real life and if you prepare you simulate it's like a, a flight simulator if you prepared for it you experience them in an environment where you can manage them. It's an old cognitive behavioral psychology uh, tenet. Then you are better off, uh, then you are better able to manage them in real life. So again, you know, those kind of stories may act as a, as a sort of emotional education. So just, thank you. We're running out of time, but I have one more brief question for you. And it is, when is lunch? No. Well, soon. Yeah. But, the question uh, is that yesterday we discussed how uh, empirical ecofism exposes some of the weaknesses of uh, more traditional ecofism. So keep it short, but I have to ask you, what are the weak points or the challenges of empirical ecocriticism right now? Huh. No, it's uh, th there are plenty. Uh, there are plenty because it is a young it is a young field, and you know there are plenty of. Uh, topics that are not covered, uh, let's say attitudes toward plants. You know, you could say, and I had those comments to say, this is so animalocentric. You know, you're not doing stuff about plants or uh, non-animate objects and so on. So that's a, that's a, that's a, clear, that's a clear limitation um, in that respect and we need to expand that. Also, uh, no one in empirical ecocritism has done any uh, research on, uh, let's say empirical research on uh, channels of distributions of narratives. And there are, there, there, it's very important for the function of narratives, who publishes them, there are gatekeepers who control which narratives get published and so on. This is a very important thing to know if you wanna know how uh, narratives function in society. 
uh, and, and that is that. And I look at you and I'm reminded of empirical research, which shows that when people are hungry, uh, they get more negative uh, in their assessment of anything. There's this research which shows uh, uh, they actually tested how uh, severe the sentences given by judges are after lunch and before lunch. So I'm afraid that if I don't finish right now, you're going to judge whatever I say very negatively. So thank you all. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Elisa, for thank brilliant you, comments. You. And thank you all for brilliant questions. Thank you. Thank you. So it's lunch time. Hopefully for you too. Yes. Thank you.